Okay, so let's start as we did uh, last time. Um, <clears throat> so why don't you guys begin with any questions you have about the reading thus far, um, or anything that you've noticed that you'd really like to point out or talk about. I, part of what I've read, I just kind of noticed like um, how Robinson Crusoe began to develop as like the post-colonial thing. Like from my, taking what I took from um, Doctor's brain class, I forgot. Post-colonialist literature. It's like how the people from um, Europe came over to America. I think like it's God's will to do something like that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So you're, okay, you're talking like from colo like colonial federalist. Yes. Literature. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and, you know, when we talk about colonial America, right? That's exactly what we're talking about. We're still talking about a process of European colonialism. Now we don't usually think of. American literature as a post-colonial literature. Like usually when we use the term post-colonial, we're talking about countries that were decolonized much more recently. Um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Nigeria, Kenya, um, <coughs> Haiti, right? Um, and we're talking about countries that were where the the native majority was then left in charge, right? Um, the Americas are a kind of special case in that um, the native majority, like the settler minority after decolonization still ended up in charge. Um, so, but yeah, I think um, you've got the religious aspect of this, right? Yeah, you know, we talked last time about how he's always referring to providence, right? That it is God's will that he be on this island. That it is God's will that he alone was spared of all his shipmates. And that it is God's will that he take advantage of everything the island has to offer him, right? So we did talk last time about the island as a sort of spiritual exercise for him, right? In some ways, he seems to view his exile on the island through the lens of certain biblical narratives, right? In particular, the prodigal son. story of Jonah, right? Of course, the difference between Crusoe and the prodigal son is that the prodigal son gets to go home um, whenever he wants to. Crusoe, not so much. You know, a whole lot of ocean and no ship uh, between self and home. Um, but yeah, the whole idea here, right, is that the new world was this kind of peaceable kingdom, this kind of new Eden, where European settlers could be things, could become things that they couldn't be in the more stratified society that they came from, right? Which is why so many of the early settlers of the Americas were religious dissenters, right? They were religious dissenters who were operating on profit motive as much as religious motive, right? They were coming here to make money as much as they were for religious freedom. But there is, yeah, this Calvinist underpinning to much of what they do, right? And again, like, you know, just to sort of remind you of where we, what we talked about last time, right? This idea, this belief in providence is intensely fatalist. It's based in part on this idea, and you know this is um, an idea that dates back to early Christianity, or at least to early medieval Christianity, um, the writings of Saint Augustine, that God already already knows everything you are going to do before you were born. 
he already knows all of the choices that you're going to make. And so, before you are born, he has already decided whether you are saved or damned. And so the hand of providence is present in all things. Yeah, Brandon. Can you explain more about the fatalist thing you can? Uh, sure. It, it, essentially, that, that what, what is going to happen to you, what God is going to do about you, according to someone who believes in divine providence, right? it's already determined. right? If God is omniscient, he already knows how you're going to respond to particular situations. And so, he has already decided what to do about you in said situations. Right, so your life's like your life's path is largely set before you're even born, and Providence keeps giving all of Crusoe these signs and signals, right, that you are not supposed to go to sea, but he goes off to sea anyway, continues to ignore them, and we see how that turns out for him. But by the middle of the novel, does his situation does he seem to regard his situation as quite so bleak? as he did in the first 70 pages or so. No, it kind of changes. Yeah, how is, he, how, is he, how is he different in the sort of middle portion of the novel? Is he a little bit more positive? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> he's building things on the island, right? If we look at page 74, sort of like the very beginning of today's reading, I found now I had business enough to gather and carry home, and I resolved to lay up a store as well as, a, as well of grapes, as limes and lemons, to furnish myself for the wet season, which I knew was approaching. In order to this, I gathered a great heap of grapes in one place, and a lesser heap in another place, and a great parcel of limes and lemons in another place. And taking a few of each with me, I traveled homeward, and resolved to come again, bring a bag or sack, or what I could make to carry the rest home. Accordingly, Having spent three days in this journey, I came home, so I must now call my tent in my cave. But before I got thither, the grapes were spoiled, the richness of the fruits and the weight of the juice having broken them, and bruised them. They were good for little or nothing. As to the limes, they were good, but I could bring but a few. So what is he noting the disadvantage, like, the disadvantage of here? What can he know? What does he feel he can no longer survive by doing? Um, I guess being paranoid or something. Well, did did he grow these grapes or these limes or these lemons? No. He just found them, right? Mm -hmm. So he's basically been living as a hunter gatherer up to this point. But what does he discover here about the hunter gatherer lifestyle? Is it easy to store up food if you're a hunter-gatherer? And having to carry it and stuff as far as the tools. Exactly, having to transport it, right? Laying in a store for, you know, the fallow season, right? When you're not going to be able to get these fruits. Not only that, but like the hunting, you know, when he goes out hunting goats, right? The hunting of the goats is more difficult than it would be to get meat if he just had a bunch of tame goats in an enclosure, right? So he's coming to the conclusion here that he's going to have to start practicing agriculture and animal husbandry. So while he keeps talking about relying on providence, right, if he's really relying on providence, he's just kind of relying on things to fall on his lap. He's starting to think more like a colonist now. He's not just trying to gather in as much food as he needs to survive, right? He's trying to gather in a surplus. And if he wants to do that, he's got to start growing his own food. Right? A little further down the page, right? When I came home from this journey, 
I contemplated with great pleasure the fruitfulness of the valley and the pleasantness of the situation, the security from storms on that side the water and the wood, and concluded that I had pitched upon a place to fix my abode, which was by far the worst part of the country. Upon the whole, I began to consider of removing my habitation and to look out for a place equally safe as where I was now situated, if possible, in that pleasant, fruitful part of the island. So what we have here is that kind of pastoral, peaceable kingdom kind of language, right? This island, even though he's settled in the wrong part of it, is ripe with possibility. There is so much he could do here, so much he could make here, so much he could build here. But in order to do so, he's going to have to start laying claim to it. Right? He can't continue hiding in his little castle, as he calls it, on the least fertile part of the island, right? Now there are practical advantages to where he has set his main habitation, right? In that it's the place where he's most likely to have his fire seen by a passing ship, right? So if he wants rescue, that's where he ought to stay. But the longer he spends on the island, the more he thinks about exploiting the island's resources. Right, page 75. Right? I was so enamored of this place that I spent much of my time there for the whole remaining part of the month of July. And though upon second thoughts I resolved as above not to remove, yet I built me a little kind of bower and surrounded it at a distance with a strong fence, being a double hedge as high as I could reach, well staked, and filled between with brushwood. And here I lay very secure, sometimes two or three nights together, always going over it with the ladders as before, so that I fancied now I had my country house and my seacoast house. And this work took me up to the beginning of August. Now a couple of things to notice in the language of this paragraph, right? When he discovers this lovely, fruitful place, what's his first impulse? What does he decide he needs to do with this? To, relo to relocate near where there's food and wonderful sources. Well, he, yeah, he thinks about that, right? But ultimately doesn't, right? What does he actually do with this place? He wants to make it as much like where he was before. Europe. Yeah, the language makes it English, yeah. right? He starts calling it his country house. Now, as a member of the lower middle class in England, Crusoe could not have had a country house, right? If he'd stuck to that middle station of life that his father recommends as the best, right? He would not have had a seacoast house and a country house. But out here on his island, he can play at being Lord of the Manor, right? And how does he secure his country abode? Yeah, same way he secures everything, right? He builds a friggin' fence. Right. This seems to be just about his first impulse whenever he encounters something he likes, right? He's going to build a fence around it. Now, the interesting thing about Crusoe's attitude, to, attitude towards enclosure, apart from the fact that it sort of demonstrates a certain level of paranoia on his point, like, is there any practical reason for him to enclose his country house at this point? Has he seen another person since he's been on the island? 
And is any of the wildlife threatening to him? Yeah, there's nothing he needs protection from, right? At least not yet. He has no reason to be afraid. But he still feels the need to enclose everything, to fence things off. Um, and here's part of the reason why, right? So in the 17th century in England, Most people still lived in rural villages. And your village would be a sort of collection of, you know, houses, you know, maybe, you know, a little, a little shop here and there, and farms surrounding a large village common or village green. And this village green was public land, right? It was for everyone's use. Anybody could graze their cattle there. Anybody could have a little garden patch there, what have you, right? Now, <clears throat> certain British aristocrats in this period got it into their heads that this was an unprofitable use of land. And that if they started building enclosures on these village greens where they would just keep livestock, right? They could make more money. They could raise more cattle. They could raise more sheep or pigs or whatever, right? So all over England and Scotland, these village greens, these traditional common areas, uh, became enclosed and whole villages um, were essentially shut down um, to encourage the production of more livestock. So this is the situation that Crusoe is leaving in England, or is left behind in England, and that he is, in a way, kind of rebuilding in the new world. Right? He's making enclosures everywhere he goes. Right? The enclosure demonstrates that this is private property. Right. The enclosure shows that this belongs to somebody. And trespassers had better beware. But as we noted, right, he, he doesn't really have any reason to be afraid of anyone yet, right? But if we look at this from a Marxist critical perspective, and why not, right? It's fun. Does anybody remember, we talked in the first day about the distinction between base and superstructures. Does anybody remember what these terms mean? Okay, so the base, right, is the economic mode of production in any given society, right? how a society allocates its resources in order to produce and distribute goods. The superstructure, then, is all of the cultural formations built on top of that base, right? So the shape of the base determines what culture is going to look like, right? How culture is going to develop, right? So an economic base that encourages the acquisition of private property and the closing off of private property from public use 
right, is going to find itself imitated in cultural practices as well. Right. Hence, Crusoe's focus right, on providence, on God's interest in the welfare of the single individual subject, rather than society as a whole, right? He chose me and plucked me out of the sea. And his replication of the cultural conditions of his home country, right? Even as he has no real reason to replicate them, right? He still thinks in terms of someone whose goal is to acquire as much private property as possible and enclose it so no one else can get it. Now, what did you make of the moment on page, where the hell is it, 112, when he's walking on the beach and finds the footprint? It happened one day about noon, going towards my boat. I was exceedingly surprised at the print of a man's naked foot on the shore, which was very plain to be seen in the sand. I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had seen an apparition. I listened, I looked around me, I could hear nothing, nor see anything. I went up to a rising ground to look further, farther. I went up to the shore and down the shore, but it was all one. I could see no other impression but that one. I went to it again to see if there were any more, and to observe if it might not be my fancy. But there was no room for that. For there was exactly the very print of a foot, toes, heel, and every part of a foot. How it came thither I knew not, nor could in the least imagine. But after innumerable fluttering thoughts, like a man perfectly confused and out of myself, I came home to my fortification, not feeling, as we say, the ground I went on, but terrified to the last degree, looking behind me every two or three steps, mistaking every bush and tree, and fancying every stump at a distance to be a man. Nor is it possible to describe how many various shapes a frighted imagination represented things to me in, how many wild ideas were found every moment in my fancy, and what strange, unaccountable whimsies came into my thoughts by the way. So he's been on the island a long time by now, right? He's been on the island about 15 years. And this is the first sign that he has seen of any human being apart from himself. This footprint in the sand. And does it seem to fill him with hope and encouragement? No. He freaks out and runs back to his castle, right? The footprint is an occasion for terror, not for joy or hope, right? The presence of other people on his island is a threat. Now, why might he find this footprint so threatening. Why should this be an occasion for fear? I guess because they could have more resources. They could get the advantage over him. Okay, oh, if this is someone who already has more resources? Maybe. There's always a possibility. He's already paranoid. He, yeah, he's already paranoid. Yeah. Yeah, what are you going to say? Um, maybe because he doesn't want really to take all the stuff he's acquired over the 15 years? Yeah, he, he hasn't had to share anything, he right? Have to. Yeah. He has he spent the last 15 years gathering things and enclosing things 
and claiming things as his own. And now here is potentially someone else. Now, if that someone else is native to the island, then they have prior claim to everything Crusoe has enclosed, right? If it's another settler or exile, then this is still someone who might compete with Crusoe for resources, right? But his mind doesn't even immediately leap to the idea of an actually human foe, despite the fact that this is a human footprint. Right. When I came to my castle, for so I think I called it ever after this, I fled into it like one pursued. Whether I went over by the ladder as first contrived, or went in at the hole in the rock, which I call the door, I cannot remember, no, nor could I remember the next morning, for never frighted hare fled to cover or fox to earth with more terror of mind than I to this retreat. I slept none that night. The farther I was from the occasion of my fright, the greater my apprehensions were, which is sometimes something contrary to the nature of such things, and especially to the usual practice of all creatures in fear. But I was so embarrassed with my own frightful ideas of the thing that I formed nothing but dismal imaginations to myself even though I was now a great way off of it. Sometimes I fancied it must be the devil. And reason joined in me with this upon this supposition, for how should any other thing in human shape come into the place? Where was the vessel that brought them? What marks was there of any other footsteps? And how was it possible a man should come there? So his wild imagination takes him not to a natural human explanation, right? But it must be the devil walking upon the beach. Right? The, the worst possible kind of threat. The devil coming to harm and tempt him. And okay, yeah, he backs off from this a little bit, you know, after thinking about it, but nonetheless, right, the fact that this is where his mind goes tells us a little bit about the psychology of sort of the, the settler on the edge of what he regards as the civilized world. Right? We see similar um, narratives in early colonial American literature, right? particularly from New England, where the threats outside the border of the village are not simply physical threats, right? They're spiritual threats, right? There are devils out there in the woods. And what we're seeing here is um, one side of, or one extreme of the kinds of responses that we typically see settler cultures having to native cultures that they've sort of turned into an other, right? Right, the first response is to do what is sometimes referred to as going native. Right? The settler becomes absorbed in, integrated into the native culture and adopts um, their ways and practices, right? No longer sees himself as a sort of a kind of complete identification with the native culture. Which is often regarded as sort of more likely to happen if the settler or settlers are in a position of weakness with regard to the native culture. If, however, they find themselves in a position of strength with regards to the native culture, What we see instead is rigid enforcement of difference 
a continued insistence on the differences between the settler culture and the native culture. Right? And a very, a very sort of rigid policing of that line. If anyone is going to conform to the practices of another culture, the natives are going to conform to the settler culture. Right? That's the idea here. The settlers preserve themselves as different as a part. And that seems to be the road Crusoe takes. Right now, part of it is yet yeah, he hasn't actually met any native culture here. But he insists on his own difference from the cultures of Africa and the Americas consistently, right? Wherever he happens to be. There's, um, let's see, where is it? Uh, there's a scene in which he describes his physical appearance. In here somewhere. Right, page 109. Right. He describes his clothing, right? I had a broad belt of goat skin dried, which drew which I drew together with two thongs of the same, instead of buckles, and a kind of frog on either side of this. Instead of a sword and dagger, hung a little saw and a hatchet. One on one side, one on the other. Now, actually, the idea of bearing arms is very, very important culturally here. If you're carrying a sword and a dagger, right, only a gentleman, right, only an aristocrat, had the right to carry a sword and a dagger. So he's doing a kind of parody, and parody of that in carrying in his belt a saw and a hatchet. I had another belt not so broad and fastened in the same manner, which hung over my shoulder, and at the end of it, under my left arm, hung two pouches, both made of goat skin too, in one of which hung my powder and the other my shot. At my back I carried my basket, on my shoulder my gun, and over my head a great clumsy ugly goat skin umbrella, but which after all was the most necessary thing I had about me next to my gun. As for my face, the color of it was really not so muleta as one might expect from a man not at all careful of it and living within nine or 10 degrees of the equinox. So what is he telling us here about his skin tone? He's getting darker. Is he? Well, he, said he says he's not so dark as one might expect from a man living so close to the equator, right? Why is that goat skin umbrella something that's so important to him? What does that do? It keeps the sun off of him, right? And if he can keep the sun off of himself, what does that do to his skin? Keeps him normal. Keeps him white, right? Mm -hmm. Keeps him pale. So he says that the goatskin umbrella is so important to him because that's what's helping him maintain his whiteness, right, in this environment. Yeah, Brendan. Uh, Brendan. Yeah, is around this time is this where the concept where like. If you have wider skin, you're more superior. Is this where this concept, this time period, came into about? Well, I mean, this was certainly a kind of pervasive idea already in the culture. So, you know, I mean, look, I mean, like Europeans had been trading with Asia and with Africa for centuries. Uh, we often forget, for example, that most of North Africa was part of the Roman Empire and was actually culturally really diverse. Um, you know, there were, there were black Africans living there as well as Romans, um, as well as, you know, members of a Germanic tribe called the Vandals, right? So it's not as though the idea of interacting with someone of a different skin color than yourself was something completely new and alien and it was a totally different experience. What was different here was how much this was caught up um, in ideologies of claiming land and territory and claiming the labor of other people who were different from you. It is much easier to do that if you are able to think of yourself 
as normal and people who look different from you as other, as alien in some way, as somehow either a different kind of human from you or less human than you. And so that's a big part of what Crusoe is doing. You, you might remember um, that uh, Ben Johnson mask that I passed out to you um, on the first day of class. We didn't really have time to go over it in detail, but what happens in that particular performance, right, is the various court performers essentially show up in blackface and the actor representing the power of England promises to make them white. Right, so yeah, so in this period, whiteness for a European, particularly for an Englishman, right, does demonstrate a kind of cultural superiority, like a condition that everyone aspires to. And it actually might help if we look then at the way Crusoe physically describes Friday. Um, bottom of page 148, right? Once he has rescued Friday from the other party, right? He was a comely, handsome fellow, perfectly well made, with straight, strong limbs, not too large, tall and well shaped, and as I reckon, about 26 years of age. He had a very good countenance, not a fierce and surly aspect, but seemed to have something very manly in his face, and yet he had all the sweetness and softness of an European in his countenance, especially when he smiled. His hair was long and black, not curled like wool, his forehead very high and large, and a great vivacity and sparkling sharpness in his eyes. The color of his skin was not quite black, but very tawny, and yet not of an ugly yellow nauseous tawny, as the Brazilians and Virginians and other natives of America are, but of a bright kind of dun olive color that had in it something very agreeable, though not very easy to describe. His face was round and plump, his nose small, not flat, not flat like the Negroes, a very good mouth, thin lips, and his fine teeth well set and white as ivory. So the physical terms in which Friday is described here, right? So he's essentially make him look like a slightly darker skinned European, right? Friday is here described as a sort of redeemable kind of project for Crusoe, right? Because his facial features indicate that he's the right kind of racial type, right? And this is um, one of the great pseudosciences um, that persisted into the early 20th century um, is called physiognomy. Which informs a lot of early anthropology. And physiognomy argues that you can tell a lot about a person's um, intellectual and moral character based on their facial features. Now, the way this typically worked is that certain kinds of uh, racially typical features were described as indicating low intelligence or uh, degenerate moral character, right? So what Defoe is engaging and doing here with Friday is showing that his physiognomy does not show him to be deficient in the way some of his countrymen are. Um, I think, I know at least you took Britlet with me, right? Yes. Uh, we did Orinoco yes. in Britlet, right? There's a similar passage in Orinoco where the prince's physical features, and so he's, you know, black skinned, but his facial features, you know, he has, you know, an, an aquiline nose and, yes. you know, straight hair, and his, his features make him look like a European. This is a fairly common trope in 17th and 18th century um, English literature when they want to describe a character um, who is supposed to be, who is of a racial, a non-European racial type who they want, who they want you to regard as superior, right? 
They try to make them look more European. Yeah, Caleb. Is that the same thing with like the shape of the skull? I know we talked about that. Phrenology, yeah. 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 Phrenology was a similar sort of thing, yeah. That yeah. Cer certain head shapes would indicate uh, whether a person was of a criminal type or not, right. yeah. Uh, phrenology, yeah, is another bullshit pseudoscience. Um, yeah, I feel the bumps on your skull. That's, and that's going to tell me everything I need to know about you. But yeah, um, it is actually kind of like a little bit disturbing to think about um, how many of our social sciences, in particular, even our natural sciences, um, do have their roots in a lot of colonialist and racist assumptions. Um, anthropology being a particular offender in this regard. Criminology as well. Um, right. So, where was I going with this? Um, do you guys have any more questions about this, about Friday generally, right now, while I, while I think about this? Not a question yeah. about Friday, but Go just ahead. going back. The one and two, uh -huh. what did you call them again? Said, these are sort of two extreme poles of response to encounters with um, a cultural or racial other, right? When the settler encounters the other, they may either, you know, adopt the practices of the other, adopt the culture of the other, which are, you know, so-called going native, or they may rigidly enforce their difference with that other and really police that line, right? So this is what we see Crusoe, for example, maintaining his own whiteness. And when he first learns of the carry landing on the island, how does he intend to behave towards them? It is 18 years before he actually has direct evidence of other people landing on his island. If we look on page 120, in his frame of thankfulness, I went home to my castle and began to be much easier now as to the safety of my circumstances. Oh wait, oh no, wait, hold up, what I'm looking at for is actually further up here. Okay, page 119, right? When I was come down the hill to the shore, as I said above, being the southwest point of the island, I was perfectly confounded and amazed, nor is it possible for me to express the horror of my mind at seeing the shore spread with skulls, hands, feet, and other bones of humane bodies. And particularly I observed a place where there had been a fire made and a circle dug in the earth like a cockpit where it is supposed the savage wretches had sat down to their inhumane feastings upon the bodies of their fellow creatures. I was so astonished with the sight of these things that I entertained no notions of any danger to myself for a, from it for a long while. All my apprehensions were buried in the thoughts of such a pitch of inhuman hellish brutality and the horror of the degeneracy of humane nature, which though I had heard of often, yet I never had so near a view of before. In short, I turned away my face from the horrid spectacle, my stomach grew sick, and I was just at the point of fainting when nature discharged the disorder from my stomach. And having vomited with an uncommon violence, I was a little relieved, but could not bear to stay in the place a moment. So got, I got me up the hill again with all the speed I could and walked on towards my habitation. So, yes, the scene he stumbles upon is horrific, right? Particularly if it is the sort of scene to which you are not accustomed. And by the way, like, please do not take any of this as a defense of the practice of cannibalism, all right? But, these people have been coming to the island having these ceremonies and they've never spotted him, right? If they have spotted him, They've ignored him. So they've never actually made any threatening moves toward him. And yet, all he can think of is ways in which he might kill them. 
right? His mind immediately leaps to strategies he can use to destroy these people. Right? First people he has any direct evidence of in 18 years. And what he wants to do is kill them. Right, look on page 122. But my invention now run quite another way. For night and day, I could think of nothing but how I might destroy some of these monsters in their cruel, bloody entertainment, and if possible, save the victim they should bring hither to destroy. It would take up a larger volume than this whole work is intended to be, to set down all the contrivances I hatched, or rather brooded upon in my thought, for the destroying these creatures, or at least frightening them, so as to present their, prevent their coming hither any more. But all was abortive, nothing could be possible to take effect, unless I was to be there to do it myself. And what could one man do among them, when perhaps there might be twenty or thirty of them together with their darts or their bows and arrows, with which they could shoot as true a mark as I could with my gun? Sometimes I contrived to dig a hole under the place where they made their fire, and put in five or six pounds of gunpowder, which then they kindled their fire, would, cons would consequently take fire and blow up all that was near it. But as in the first place I should be very loath to waste so much powder upon them, my store being now within the quantity of one barrel. So neither could I be sure of its going off at any certain time, when it might surprise them, and at best, that it would do little more than just blow the fire about their ears and fright them, but not sufficient to make them forsake the place. So I laid it aside and then proposed that I would place myself in ambush in some convenient place with three guns all double loaded, and in the middle of their bloody ceremony let fly at them, when I should be sure to kill or wound perhaps two or three at every shoot. And then falling in upon them with my three pistols and my sword, I made no doubt but if there was twenty, I should kill them all. This fancy pleased my thoughts for some weeks, and I was so full of it that I often dreamed of it. And sometimes I was just going to let fly at them in my sleep. So, have these people presented any actual threat to him? No. Yeah. He finds their cultural practices abhorrent, but they don't seem to actually live on the island, right? They only come once in a while. And thus far, they've left him alone. So why does he feel the need to destroy them? I why does he want to blow them up? I guess because um, they're cannibals, and he thinks like, they're going to kill me eventually. So it's better to get them before they get me. OK. But um, they haven't made any sign of coming after him, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to punish evil. Like, okay. What he sees as evil. Yeah. A lot of, yeah, he's looking at them through his particular cultural moral lens, right? He sees them doing something he regards as evil, even though they clearly do not regard it as evil. And he decides that, it is, that it, it, it's his role, his duty, to punish them for it. Yeah, so that's, that's one way to interpret his actions. Yeah, what were you going to say, Lindsay? Lindsay? I was just going to say, because they are different than him, so he just, I guess, was scared of them, and he wanted to destroy them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that same terror of difference, right? And the most extreme way he can maintain his difference from this culture, right, is to offer them violence to show that he's not going to stand for their practices and their traditions by blowing up a, blowing up a barrel of gunpowder in the middle of their ceremony or killing as many of them as he can, right? Yeah, go ahead. What's up with the killing of the cats in this? Oh, yeah. Um, why does he do that? Why does he kill the cats? Yeah, I didn't understand that. Well, I guess because they are they become too numerous. Uh, but like, why does when his cats have kittens, why does he drown them? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's be, like earlier in the narrative, there's a point at which the cats he has become too numerous, and they become pests, and they start getting into his food. So yeah, he so he so he kills the excess cats, keeps two, to maintain you know protection from rats and you know, I guess you know snuggling and companionship because you know kitty cats. But yeah, um, but yeah, he, he does seem to be capable of a, he is astonishingly unsentimental to us about animals. And I think that is actually a thing we have to remember generally, is that 
our level of sentimentality towards domestic animals is a fairly recent historical development. Um, in previous generations, um, and even you know, in several cultures today, um, attitudes towards domestic animals tend to be much more pragmatic. Um, I mean, for example, um, today in China there is a, you know, a great deal of tension between rural people for whom dogs are a food source or a source of meat and more, um, more educated urban people who keep dogs as pets, right? So, you know, groups that are, you know, run out of cities will often, like, intercept trucks full of dogs that have been raised for food um, and, you know, set all the dogs free. Um, so, the cultural practices of the city take over the preferences of the rural area. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think and what we're seeing is a lot of that kind of unsentimentality, right? And at the same time, he's sometimes capable of being extremely sentimental towards animals, right? You know, there's, you know, for example, the, the, the first kid that he manages to tame, for example, right? You know, he is, his intent is to raise it up as, you know, the first um, in a flock he's going to use as a food source, but he can never bring himself to kill it. Now, the others that come later, he is less sentimental about, but yeah, he is sentimental about that first kid. Yeah, but yeah, what's going on with the cats there is just yeah, he doesn't want to be overrun with cats, and so he takes pragmatic measures to reduce their numbers. That's that's really all that is. Yeah. But I think um, it would be instructive um, if we think about the way he responds to discovering the cannibals landing on the island, to his discovery of the Spanish ship. When he finds that Spanish ship, does he feel as threatened by the potential that there may be people alive in that ship as he is threatened by the presence of the cannibals? So yeah, he clearly does not regard all human groups as equivalent threats, right? Other Europeans are not a threat and are potential companions. People who are too different from him are a potential threat, unless he can get a hold of them and mold them in his own image. Right? And I think it would bear looking at his first encounter here with Friday. Right? He rescues Friday from one of these feasts. If we look around like the middle of page 147, right? I beckoned him again to come to me and gave him all the signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every 10 or 12 steps in token of acknowledgement for, for my saving his life. I smiled at him and looked pleasantly and beckoned him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground, and laid his head upon the ground, and taking me by the foot, set my foot upon his head. This, it seems, was in token of swearing to be my slave forever. This, it seems, was in token of swearing to be my slave forever. What's the key, what's the key phrase in this sentence? It seems. Yeah, it seems. What does the it seems tell us about Crusoe's ability to interpret this gesture? Well, he could have been saying anything, but this is what he Yeah, he has, to be he has no idea what Friday actually means by doing this, right? But he interprets it in the way that is most advantageous to him. Aha, uh -huh. he puts my foot upon his head. He is swearing to be my slave forever, right? Let's just go with that. So what this demonstrates is that to Crusoe, whatever Friday's existing cultural practices or preferences are, right, don't matter. What Friday is going to have to do is conform to Crusoe's 
preferences. So even though, for example, there's no practical reason to wear clothes on this island, right? These people who are native to this part of the to, to that part of the world, Crusoe describes as mostly going around more or less naked, because it's friggin' hot. He still himself makes him this sort of goatskin getup, right? And he makes Friday wear one too. So as not to offend his own sense of modesty. And to mark Friday as one who has been sort of plucked out from the great mass, right? If we you sort of see how this continues a little bit, right? I took him up and made much of him and encouraged him all I could. But there was more work to do yet, for I perceived the savage who I knocked down was not killed, but stunned with a blow, and began to come to himself. So I pointed to him, and showing him the savage, that he was not dead. Upon this he spoke some words to me, and though I could not understand them, yet I thought they were pleasant to hear. For they were the first sound of a man's voice that I had heard my own accepted for above twenty-five years. But there was no time for reflection. The savage who was knocked down recovered himself so far as to sit up on the ground. And I perceived that my savage, right, my savage, began to be afraid. But when I saw that, I presented my other piece of the man as if I would shoot him. Upon this, my savage, for so I call him now, made a motion to lend him my sword, which hung naked in the belt, right? And so Friday goes and kills the other man. But he's, Crusoe is already speaking here in terms of possession, right? He's describing Friday as his. He does that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, ev everything is his, yeah. right? People get fenced in and enclosed with language primarily and clothes. Land, animals, everything gets enclosed. Everything has to have an owner, right? Nothing can just be sort of left unclaimed. If we look on page 149, after the physical description of Friday is over, right? I made him know his name should be Friday, which was the day I saved his life. I called him so for the memory of the time. I likewise taught him to say master, and then let him know that was to be my name. So, <clears throat> does he ever bother to ask if Friday actually already has a name, which presumably he does? He just decides what he's going to call him, right? So, I'm going to call you Friday. And he decides also what Friday is going to call him. He does not teach Friday his name. He does not teach Friday to call him Robinson, or even the more formal Mr. Crusoe, right? He teaches Friday to call him master and to answer yes and no. So we're about out of time. That's where we're going to leave it today. Um, I have some reading questions for you for next time, uh, much of which concern Crusoe's developing relationship with Friday and his attitudes towards the other inhabitants of the islands. So take down what you need. Um, don't forget to get started on a response paper sometime quite, quite soon. Um, and we'll see you all on Thursday.